Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome to the Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Uh, our show today, A View from Southern Taiwan, and today we have a husband and wife team. It's the first time we've ever done anything like this on um, uh, Asian Review. Uh, joining us via Skype from Kaohsiung is Dr. Qin Chang, uh, as a Society for Strategic Studies, uh, an expert on Taiwan military affairs, uh, who also appears on uh, Taiwan and Chinese uh, talk shows uh, regarding politics and international affairs. And then his wife also joins us. She's chairperson of the Department of International Affairs at Wenzhou Ursuline University uh, of Languages in Kaohsiung. Um, welcome to Asian Review. It's great to have you with us. Bill, yeah, we're very glad to join your program. Oh, great. That's great. Great. Well, let's uh, let's get right into it here because we've got a lot to cover here. Um, and ladies first, so I'll go to uh, Dr. Chan first. Um, Kaohsiung is known as uh, Taiwan's uh, seat of heavy industry and is also home of Taiwan's first uh, import-export processing zone. But I hear more and more people say that uh, Kaohsiung is a dying city, that so many industries have moved to China or to Southeast Asia. And I'm wondering, as an economics expert, I'm wondering what your view is on that. Uh, thank you. I think Kaohsiung um, is a uh city with uh, more uh, heavy industry and also some uh, uh, labor intensive industry. Therefore, some uh, with so-called uh, traditional industry gradually has uh, transferred to some other countries in order to get a uh, relative lower production factor, uh, local uh, production factors. So in terms of the uh, import and export, of course, in compared with a few years ago, uh, probably uh, the, the, uh, the figure, the numbers has reduced a little bit. But I won't say uh, Gaoshin is a dying city because actually in the most recent years, under the mayor Henji's uh, administration, I would, let's not say good or bad, but actually has to do some great efforts. And also in terms of uh, uh, since Belgium is a uh, uh, ocean city, uh, the, the government has tried to uh, take use of this uh, advantage, or we say the leverage, to uh, introduce some new industries such as the uh, yacht building. So in the, in the most recent years, the government has uh, organized some exhibition for shipyards. So, so I think um, Kaohsiung, in the future, will find its own way to way out. It's interesting that you mentioned yachts, because I can see those some of those fancy yachts made in Kaohsiung right here in Honolulu Harbor. <laughs> Before we go any further, we should tell everybody that Honolulu, where we're broadcasting from, and Kaohsiung are sister cities. So we're doing a little bit of PR work for, for each city here today. Um, well, you know, as um, it's also said that the New South policy, one of uh, Tsai Ing-wen's uh, uh, big policies uh, uh, about uh, diversifying um, uh, Taiwan's economy away from China uh, and towards Southeast Asia, is going to be based in Kaohsiung. Uh, and it, will that really help Kaohsiung? Will that really be of benefit? Do you see any effect of that yet? Um. Of course, uh, the southbound policy is a new policy. Actually, we are also trying to figure out what will be the uh, the advantage for the overall economy development. Uh, in the most recent, the cross trade economic interaction uh, actually intensified after the DPP government taking over the power in Taiwan in 2016. Even the Thai government has expressed is concerned for many times. Nevertheless, the mega chain seems to somehow irreversible. This may put Taiwan in a very embarrassing situation. Mm. Uh, many efforts have been paid to control the situation, yet um, it is still getting worse and worse to some people. On the, on the other hand, some people may argue otherwise to them, a strong cross-trade tide may reduce the likelihood of uh, 
instability. So whether Taiwan may have a close economic relationship with men in China can be an advantage or a disadvantage. It is still a, a contending issue in the security community in Taiwan. The, mm. the southbound policy is basically a government's new idea to uh, try to transfer the, the investment or uh, investment from Taiwan, uh, China to South, Southeast Asia country. And whether Thai, uh, Kaohsiung can uh, take advantage from this, I think it's, uh, it's up to the business person. I, from my point of view, business person, they can smell. They know hmm. where is the business opportunity. Uh -huh. So, <laughs> Asia country is a developing uh, the economy then can help them to make money. I think the business person will go, of course. And if it, and and if it, there's not a business opportunity there, uh, I don't think business will will uh, will follow government's policy. So <laughs> I think it's for the business person. And but I, I have to mention that if a Taiwan, uh, the economic interaction with China. So we stop the interaction with China, I think we will die mm -hmm. to some extent. And if we uh, interact poorly or worsely, then I think we also die. We need to interact economically with China smartly. Mm. I think this is our way to survive and wow. the way to develop economic That's a very interesting answer. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, I often hear it said, uh, that uh, when it comes to tra signing a trade deal, uh, for example, when uh, Taiwan entered the WTO, that northern Taiwan industries benefited, but southern Taiwan farmers lost out. They were at a disadvantage. And is, is that true? Is there a, this big difference between southern Taiwan and northern Taiwan? Southern Taiwan, outside of Kaohsiung, uh, and outside of the Tainan Science Park, is it basically agricultural and northern Taiwan is mostly industrial? Um, uh, actually, Taiwan is not big. And of course, according to the, the, the place where the uh, race the agriculture is, of course, is uh, uh, on the middle part of the Taiwan and also southern, uh, southern part of the Taiwan. Um, enter the WTO. Of course, in in WTO, there is we we need to open our market to uh, other other countries' products, including the agriculture. Actually, from my understanding, uh, of course, they must have some challenge to to those farmers. But I I I will not say uh, it has caused a huge challenge mm. because for some products. Taiwan's uh, uh, quality is pretty good, but uh, since you know Taiwan has some typhoon or uh, during some rainy season, and that uh, during that period we need to import some some uh, vegetables or some products, some agricultural products. But in terms of uh, the overall uh, challenge, I, I, I will not say that has uh, if our farmers huge challenge or uh, cause uh, some uh, huge problem for the, the their living. You, you know, one of the big issues right now between the uh, United States and Taiwan is uh, deals with the import of pork. And of course, there are a lot of pork farmers in Taiwan. I wonder if most of those pork farmers are in southern Taiwan. Uh, pork, it should be raising not only in southern Taiwan, but also North Taiwan. Northern they Taiwan, have uh, some farm. But I think um, for the reason why currently we haven't uh, opened our market to uh, to some some part of the pork from United States, I think as we, we all know that, why, that the reason, I think um, this is not an uh, answer I, 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 I could answer here. <laughs> okay, I think, okay. I, 
Well, I, I, thought, I thought you were going to say the ractopamine, that that's the additive to the pork, that the U.S. pork raisers are really crazy about. Um, I, I thought you were going to say that, but uh, <laughs> maybe you don't want to go there. Um, well, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your university and your Department of International uh, Relations? Okay, uh, thank you so much to give us uh, this opportunity. Wenzhou Atla University of Languages is the uh, only foreign language university in Taiwan. But my department is not a teaching language. Mm. My department is teaching some um, international affairs expertise to students, including international politics, international economics, and international cultural studies. We use uh, English as our teaching tool mm. to deliver our expertise to, to students. So uh, we have uh, not only the bachelor's degrees for, uh, for students study for uh, four years program, but also we have a two years master's program. We, we try to uh, train the students to be, uh, yes, I have uh, some social here. Oh, good, good, good. A master's degree program of uh, international affairs. Then we try to train students uh, to be an elite of international affairs with uh, both uh, uh, global perspective and humanitarian concerns. Because I think uh, in this uh, global globalization era, uh, students not only study what happened in Taiwan, but we need to, they need to understand what happened uh, worldwide, but not only you know how to make money, but also need to have uh, some humanitarian concern to to deliver their concern to everybody. So uh, I hope uh, uh, if, if there any anyone interested in this program can just uh, uh, send send your send email or visit our. Our website. Here's a. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, move, uh, move it over just a little bit. I I uh, that has the email there. Okay, email and also actually you can scan the QR code. Oh okay, good good. So then you get all information. So if there's anybody who would like to study international relations in southern Taiwan, this is your answer to the to that desire. Yeah, great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. It's really good to talk to you. Let, let's move on now to, well, let's take a break first. Let's do a break, and uh, we'll take a break right now, and when we come back, we'll talk to Dr. Ching Zhang, and we'll talk about some military and strategic affairs. You're watching uh, Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Uh, I'm, my guests today are joining us via Skype from uh, southern Taiwan, the city of Kaohsiung. Dr. Chan and Dr. Zhang, and we'll be right back, so don't go away. Aloha kako. I am Andrea, I am from Italy, and I've been studying and working here in Hawaii for more than three years for my PhD. Hawaii is home to a truly fantastic community of middle and high school students. And did you know some of them are currently out there, right now, using their free time to invent new quantum computers? And did you know some of them are exploring cybersecurity and the new frontiers of robotics? I am just always amazed as I talk to them at science fairs. Oh, but, but there's more. Did you know that these students are coming here on FinTech Hawaii to share their story with us? Come and join the new Young Talent Making Way show and discover how these students are shaping our future. Starting on February the 6th, every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Only here at FinTech Hawaii. Mahalo. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, A View from Southern Taiwan, and we're trying to do two things at once here. We're talking about economic issues as they impact Southern Taiwan, and in particular, the city of Kaohsiung. And now we're going to talk about some military and strategic affairs. Well, um, 
So a lot of concern in the U.S. about Taiwan's military readiness, especially that of the reserve force in Taiwan. There's three million reserves. But my understanding is they're not really all that well trained, and there's insufficient equipment to provide them with if they were ever mobilized. And I wonder what, uh, I, I wonder what your view of, is of that. I would like to say that we are under the well, the military threat is from the mainland China uh, is over uh, well half century. After the civil wars, uh, when the nationalist government retracted to Taiwan in 1949, and uh, well, this situation lasted for 30 years, until in 1979, when the People's Republic of China in Beijing and the uh, uh, United States uh, established a diplomatic relationship. During that time, they do have a promise, a political promise, as a one China, but two systems, and uh, they were peacefully seeking for unification. But this situation lasted uh, for several years until there's a uh, several well, dramatic turn. The first is happened in 1989. You all know about the Tiananmen Square, which they also, I mean, just uh, changed the U.S. change the policy more or less, but never say it clearly. The other one is the end of the Cold War, when the U.S. approach to uh, Beijing basically is using uh, China, the red China, as a China card to deal with the Soviet Union. Mm. When the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, then the strategic value, well, from, well, the red China to U.S. also decreased. And then the other one, uh, well, incident happened is uh, 1994, you know, when the the uh, President Clinton, well, allowed the, the late our president, the former president, the leading way business Cornell University. Then there will be a deterioration, dramatic deterioration. But later, there's a 1995, 1996, another missile test crisis. But however, for so many years, we, we have successfully passed the economic miracle or economic reform, start from land reform and the from the assistance of U.S. aid. But however, you know, the people changed the attitude. Start from in 1987, when the cross strait relationship, which then the ban was lifted by late President Jiang Jingguo, then the situation cross strait relationship changed. At that time, all the combat, all, all the operational readiness gradually decreased. And our defense investment. You're saying, uh, you're saying that even while Zhang Jingguo was alive, the, the combat readiness began to go down, decline? Yes, the more or less. The, and then the force reduction is a start from the, well, the, during the uh, President Zhang Jingguo era. The situation is that in 1979, you know, in the first 10 years, uh, from 1979 until 1987, those years is a full uncertainty. It takes uh, several years until, you know, finally, the, in 1987, we lift the ban, then people start to cross the street exchange. You know, the, a lot of average, uh, okay. they can go back. To the okay, but what about okay. today? Is the Taiwan military ready today? If, if, um, if China decides it's going to invade Taiwan, Xi Jinping wants to take back Taiwan so he can, uh, becomes a very famous person in Chinese history, is Taiwan ready? Well, I would say that first, these assumptions more or less can be challenged because uh, till now, even there's uh, several downturns uh, like the situation or the tension, like the uh, happened in 19, well, 1906 uh, or 1995, and later on near the year 2000. Even all those the situation, those tension actually happened. I would like to argue that there is no clear, well, indication to abandon abandoned the so-called uh, peaceful unification policy till now. Even in the 90th uh, Chinese Communist Party's uh, National Congress, uh, they keep on re address about the base talk about uh, Taiwan's policy is the uh, one China and uh, peaceful resolution, mm. the peaceful unification. But there's always uh, some rumor and always some people, they advocate and they well, believe that, uh, well, the, there's a certain uh, possibility to trick about the uh, use of force invasion. If that would be the case, it will start from, by several conditions. One of the strongest reasons is Taiwan declared, well, 
de jure the independent. Right. Now we are de facto independent. So the matter is, uh, well, it's always a certain kinds of danger exists. Yeah. But the, the, the problem is, uh, who may trick the danger? They will be decided by Taipei. Well, you know, uh, it's it's interesting that you mentioned uh, that when Zhang Jingguo was still alive, uh, that, that there was a, a force reduction. But it seems today that— yeah. initial, initial case. Initial case. It seems today one of the biggest challenges facing the Taiwan military is getting a sufficient number of people to join the military. And I understand that Tsai Ing-wen is going to phase out conscription. So it's going to be all volunteer, but Taiwan hasn't been able to meet its volunteer goals. So I, I, yes. I, I, I this is, I, I don't know what's going to happen and how this is going to impact Taiwan's combat readiness. I don't understand how it's going to impact the ready, the reserve system. Well, it actually uh, hurts the combat readiness dramatically. I personally disagree with the way. Well, abolish the conscript system. I mean, uh, well, the old well, let me let me clarify Soviet that point. You you oppose the uh, abolition or the doing away of the conscription system? Yes, the, because the, they will just uh, disconnect the connection between the society and the military. Right. All voluntary, uh, all voluntary system. Now there's a certain kinds of social condition you must meet with that. For with that regards, uh, Taiwan has no well proper that. Uh, the social background to support that. Nowadays, mm -hmm. all this uh, like so-called all voluntary service actually is a favor the rich people. The only the people come from the weak, relative the weak the class that they join the military. So this is reason why the recruitment and the retention rate is always be a challenge. And there, and uh, everybody was uh, all the people in the military suffer from that. And uh, the. In, the really hard point I would like to point that, you know, the defense policy according to the law here in Republic of China, it actually should be responsible by the whole cabinet. The premier is the one who actually should be formulating the defense policy. Mm. But unfortunately, everybody put the burden only on those uh, defense ministry. Uh, so who about uh, the sufficient manpower should be the ministry, interior is the ministry. But everybody just uh, threw that things, uh, you know, lost the burden to military. So military is the one who very lonely, you know, shoulder the, the right. cross yeah. uh, about the you know, it, you know, I have the impression that the Taiwan population doesn't give very much respect to the military. Yes. Unfortunately, this is the case. Why? The, Why? Because there's a threat. Well, and there's a threat called China. <laughs> there's a definite, clear threat. <laughs> this is exactly I would like to uh, address about the reason why I will oppose about the conscript system. Conscript system is make all the young men in one society. No one can walk away from this danger. Mm -hmm. First, uh, they like to change the to the all voluntary service and uh, through the burden to a certain class of people. And there's a lot of very enthusiastic uh, political, well, well, the politicians or the future politicians lay stem on the military. They put a uh, military as an equal sign to the older clan of the, the KMT, the influence the, the, mm -hmm. the organization. Mm -hmm. So this is a certain way, you know, they mobilize their vote. But this is the destroyed the image of the whole armed forces. So the morale is affected by this. About several years ago, there's an incident happened in the Hong Kong I remember he, that. Uh, he had just against the discipline. He'd been sent to the discipline camp. But for some of the accident, he lost okay. his life. It will become an excuse, you know, and become a political movement. The Tsai Yuen, the President Tsai Yuen, at that time, she personally joined that movement and to, well, tarnish the, the image and uh, to make the military look very ugly. Now, unfortunately, she is the commander-in-chief. Now become a very embarrassing dilemma. So this is exactly what I say. During our condition, we don't have the social condition which is proper enough to accept the all-voluntary system. 
We still need a country. Let no one can walk away from that. Now, that, that's, a very, that's a very yeah. interesting point. I, I have to interject here. I've just been told that we have a minute and a half left, which is, as I told you, this time goes by really, really fast. Um, but I, I think you're making some really good points here. Is you know, and I would agree with you based on my knowledge of, of Taiwan issues. Is Taiwan needs a hey, conscript are, system. And, 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 and you it's, are Vietnam War veteran. You know the feeling. You know, right. Everyone is a country, so you gotta respect that. Even you join the Vietnam War, this is the same, the same thing. Everybody should do their share for their country. Right? I I agree with you. I agree with you quite quite wholeheartedly. Um, and, and I'm sorry that it seems like we're run out of time, but as I told you, the, and as I mentioned, the time goes by so very fast. Um, but you, you brought out some really good points, as did Dr. Chun, and I, and I think our audience will really quite benefit from those. And uh, maybe we'll have to do this again sometime. Yeah, but thank you so much for joining us. I'm sorry we had some technical issues in the beginning, but, you know, that kind of stuff happens. And... Uh, it's really good to visit with you for a half an hour or so this afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank you for watching today. Uh, Asian Review will be right back here next week at the same time. My guest at that time will be um, retired uh, Republic of China Admiral uh, Lawrence Dunn, who also served as uh, Taiwan's naval attaché in Washington. And we'll see you then.